Technology has traditionally been seen by the public and many in the media in a more hopeful light. But 2017 felt different, a year that frequently cast technology and its unintended consequences in a much harsher light. In a moment, we'll have a conversation that I recorded last week in New York. But first, a quick reminder about some of the major problems this year. Russia used Facebook and social media to try and influence the 2016 elections. The revelations reverberated throughout the nation's capital this year. As congressional Exhibit committees two, detailed, Russian operatives bought ads that sought to capitalize on racial, religious, and political divisions in the U.S. Just 120 fake accounts posted on Facebook 80,000 times and reached as many as 126 million Americans. Facebook's CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, initially doubted that the platform could have influenced the election, Facebook but later to pledged to make political advertising transparency. more transparent. Not only will you have to disclose which page paid for an ad, but we will also make it so you can visit an advertiser's page and see the ads that they're currently running to any audience on Facebook. Members of both parties were angry at the company's slow admission, but the focus grew beyond just one company to other tech giants since Russian agents use Twitter, Google, and YouTube too. The Senate Intelligence Committee grilled top lawyers for the companies. Many of us on this committee have been raising this issue since the beginning of this year. And our claims were frankly blown off by the leaderships of your companies, dismissed, said there's no possibility, nothing like this happening, nothing to see here. Hacking, a perennial problem, took on new urgency this past year. The ransomware cyber attack called WannaCry temporarily crippled computer systems in hospitals, banks, and companies around the world. More than 230,000 computers in 150 countries were affected. Just a week ago, the Trump administration named the country it says was responsible. After careful investigation, the United States is publicly attributing the massive WannaCry cyber attack to North Korea. We do not make this allegation lightly. We do so with evidence and we do so with partners. Hackers also tore into Equifax, one of the largest credit bureaus, stealing the personal information of more than 145 million people. They got social security numbers, birth dates, addresses, and driver's licenses. The tech industry faced a new conversation on inequality by race and gender. Susan Fowler, a former engineer at Uber, published a damning account of a harassment-filled workplace culture. Uber fired 20 employees, and it eventually helped lead to the CEO's resignation. She told Time she so was amazed by the started. reaction to her essay. Long. I expected it would be like a 24-hour, you know, like viral thing, but it didn't slow down at all. And I was reading through all these things, and I thought like, oh my gosh, like I'm not alone. Others like Ellen Pau, who filed and lost a gender discrimination case against a powerful venture capital firm, said change was needed. Well, I think if playing along means, you know, participating in sexist and racist jokes, that expectation has to change. The year ended with a divisive decision by the FCC that many fear will lead to the end of net neutrality. The idea of treating all content on the web equally without charging more or blocking your ability to see other content. For a closer look at the potential turning point that 2017 is shaping up to be for the most well-known tech giants, I'm joined by two people who follow that world closely. Farhad Manju is a New York Times columnist who writes on how technology is changing society and business. And David Kirkpatrick is the founder of Techonomy. He's a technology journalist and author of The Facebook Effect. Thank you both for joining us. So, uh, Farhad, let me start with you. Um, how did tech shift in our perception this year? Yeah, I think we got... Uh, justifiably a lot less optimistic about tech and a lot more um, worried about uh, the implications of a few big tech companies kind of taking over much of the world, much of our communications, much of uh, um, how we kind of learn and experience the world, all of our personal information. Um, and I think the tech companies responded to that. Um, they started to notice, I mean, uh, after the questions about the Russia hack, after questions about um, sexual harassment, um, they started to respond to these criticisms. And I think the key change they made was um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the big tech companies started at first grudgingly and then um, more willingly, I think, um, they started to accept that they have some responsibility 
to the rest of the world, that their technologies aren't um, necessarily kind of neutral platforms and uh, that they have some responsibility to kind of police what happens there. Um, how that plays out, I think, will be the big question of 2018. Um, but this year, I think that the, the big change is that in the past, um, technology companies sort of thought of themselves as kind of neutral. And, and I think that started to change. They're less neutral now. David Kirkpatrick, what happened to make Silicon Valley less the sort of darling of well, Washington, D.C., as well as Wall Street? Well, if there's one single thing that changed the situation, I would say it's Russian fake news affecting the election uh, in the opinion of and, and the desire of Russia to alter our electoral process and using Facebook and Google, but Facebook in particular, as a key means of doing that. And I think what that concern at a national level did was draw attention to the extraordinary social, cultural, and informational weight of these companies, and then caused a lot of people to start asking bigger questions about what it meant that these very small number of tech giants have had such a monumental impact on our social dialogue and have, in effect, become the central platform for social dialogue and increasingly, in many ways, for political uh, behavior as well. Mark Zuckerberg famously said it's a crazy idea that they would have had any impact on the U.S. elections. And then since then, he's made several statements that walk that back. Right. He said that to me on my techonomy stage at 2016, two days after the election, in which, by the way, I also asked him if Facebook had special responsibilities because of its scale, and he essentially demurred on that. Uh, so, again, while I agree with what Farhad said, it's really notable how much he has changed since then. I think David's right. Mark Zuckerberg has changed in a way that I've been surprised by. When he started Facebook, the main sort of idea behind Facebook was that he wanted to kind of connect the world. Connecting the world, he argued, was enough. And that was kind of the general feeling among others in the tech industry, that just sort of building the technology, the technology itself would kind of help people, would uh, democratize the world. Um, and now the thing that Mark Zuckerberg talks about is uh, not just connecting people, but creating meaningful connections. This is a meaningful is a word he's been using more often lately. What that means exactly is not clear, uh, but you know they plan to change uh, the Facebook news feed uh, mm -hmm. to address some of these concerns, both the fake news concerns, but also this idea that Facebook might be kind of um, putting us into echo chambers, kind of splintering much of uh, our dialogue. Well, Farhad, how much of this has to do with who is designing the underlying technology in the first place? This is a, a big problem for them to solve. The big tech companies are all based on the west coast of the United States, you know, several here in California and, and then a couple in Seattle. Their sort of workforces kind of look the same. They're not very diverse. They're not gender diverse. They don't have a lot of minorities. They're not kind of class diverse or geographically diverse. And they are increasingly gatekeepers for information for not just the United States, but the entire planet. And so you really have this question where there are a small number of people who are essentially homogenous, um, kind of making decisions for the rest of the world. David Kirkpatrick, what's the likelihood then of these technologists attacking the problems that are underlying this, the diversity, the lack of transparency, uh, and the ultimate consequences of the tools that they build? Well, I think there's no question there is a major shift underway in the mindset of the Silicon Valley uh, workforce and the leaders of these companies that they have to do that. However, uh, as Farhad's written and as I firmly believe, it is an extremely challenging project to understand the true weight of these massively important systems in our society and how to actually more effectively manage them. I mean, it's a question of governance, in effect. And the reality is when the public square is, in effect, dominated by commercial enterprises, um, who should regulate that is entirely undetermined. Clearly, these people are starting to recognize if they don't take actions that appear to be in the public's benefit, they will become regulated by government, both in the United States and abroad, and that process is happening much more in Europe already. Uh, they want to desperately avoid that. On the other hand, 
the ideas aren't really even there on their part to, uh, as to what really could be done to properly regulate the flow of information, given their fundamental goal of selling advertising to make money on these services. Because advertising effectively requires eyeballs and attention, and they still are more in the mindset of drawing attention than they are of doing the right thing, in my opinion. All right. David Kirkpatrick of Techonomy and Farhad Manju of The New York Times, thank you both. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks. Thanks.